So, massive welcome to everyone here tonight. I'm live for our Module 6 live chat on fear. I'm Steph Kissenchuk, one of the behind the scenes moderators, and I'll be your main host tonight. With me here in Canberra, assisting with this broadcast, is the illustrious Katie Freund, the mysterious Crystal McLaughlin, the ever wonderful Margaret Prescott, and we also have a special guest with us here tonight, the awesome Amy, a MOOC participant who's visiting the ANU from Sydney. Unfortunately, Inga is unable to be here in person with us tonight because she's away having amazing adventures in New Zealand, being a top-notch scholar of Crazy Cool. She sends her heartfelt apologies to you all and hopefully will be with us online a bit later, fingers crossed, through the Twitter feed. All of us here in the MOOC moderation team would like to thank each and every one of you for your participation this week and also for all the wonderful videos that you've sent in. There is some really creative and exciting stuff here. Video submissions has now closed because we need to edit everything together now to make an epic joint mega video. So thank you guys. Tonight I'll be announcing this week's badges, talking a bit about fear, including my own and some of the strategies I've learned along the way, sharing with you some of the top questions from the forums, and also some resources that Inga has kindly left with me to share with you all. Once again, I'd like to say that all resources and links I mentioned here tonight in the live chat will be shared through Twitter on the hashtag SurvivePhD15 and also later in the next few days on Storify. This brings us to this week's badges. So first we have two badge awardees from the forums. Imogen Cinnamon for some truly caring and supportive responses to other participants' posts. And KK123 for a great post on the many different types of fear that PhD students can experience as well as a reply that succinctly positioned conference papers as performance. There is also one badge awardee from Twitter, at Joe Prestia for a truly lovely blog post. Thanks Joe Prestia for your genuine thoughts. Not with us tonight. Sadly not with us tonight, says Margaret, so hopefully you might be able to catch up with the Storify Joe. And now to fear. In Module 6, we looked at fear, specifically two major types of fear that can commonly emerge in the PhD journey. That is, fear of writing and fear of presenting. Both, as we found out, were related to performance anxiety. And I'm moving my notes <laughs> as we go. These are certainly not the only types of fear that can occur. Like in Module 5, where we explored loneliness, the materials online are meant to help prompt a discussion. For this week's activity, we ask you to share some experiences of fear that you personally encountered. I myself am no stranger to fear. For example, I'm usually very anxious talking or presenting in front of people, but I also absolutely love teaching. In order to teach effectively, I've had to learn to monitor and manage my fear, to practice and to gradually build up the skills it takes to share in the classroom. Fear is a mysterious, powerful and primal thing. You may have heard that there are two responses to intense fear, fight or flight. There is actually a third response, freeze. This is a bit like being a deer caught in the headlights. Everything seizes up and shuts down. I myself have experienced the fear that makes you freeze, both when trying to present and also trying to write. So today I'm going to share with you a couple of my stories, both true in case some of what I learned May, may, sorry, in case of what I've learnt, may help some others as well. So fear of presenting. The presentation where I froze was an absolute nightmare situation. It could not have got any worse. It was at a type of conference that I'd never been to before. It was the very first time I was attempting to talk without notes. It was a subject not in my direct field that I felt quite unfamiliar with, and my co-presenter, a colleague, had kept repeatedly changing our joint script right until the moment that we stood up. In reality, I only had to do a teeny tiny part of the talk, but when I got up to present, right in the front row, I spotted these high brass military personnel in their uniforms and shiny regalia looking at me sternly. In the second row were public servants in their spotless suits also appearing to look stern. In reality, they were probably just concentrating. But from the get-go, I felt intimidated and very small fry. There I was, a PhD student in my best jeans and a borrowed business jacket, trying my best to look and act professional. About to speak, my eyes accidentally locked with someone who might have been an army general, 
and I suddenly froze. I'd never experienced anything like it before. My mind went completely blank. I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't say anything. I could not even move, and it was very hard to breathe. Time distorted. I felt I was frozen for what felt like hours, but it was actually only probably a minute or two. I could feel individual beads of sweat running down my forehead. I finally managed to cough and then mutter something utterly unintelligible <laughs> to everyone. I then fled, tripped, almost face planting back to my seat. I thought I'd completely ruined my entire reputation and would never ever be able to give a talk again. So, what did I learn from that experience, apart from never again doing a presentation with that particular <laughs> colleague? <laughs> Firstly, people can actually be a lot more forgiving than we give them credit for. At morning tea, I spotted a powerful looking lady who had been at my horrendous talk, and I apologised to her for my shocking display of, of nerves, basically. Basically, she laughed and said to me, it happens to all of us from time to time. She was a regular at the conference cycle, and suggested I should definitely come back next year, and she looked forward to giving me, uh, giving me a chance to give another presentation. That lady was a total hero. The second thing is to talk about it. Although I still felt very ashamed, I phoned a very close friend. I debriefed with her and had a really good cry. Not only did this stop it going around and round in my head, it helped me get over this situation she reassured me, made me feel loved, and helped me repair my shattered confidence. Three, put it in perspective. Once I had a bit of space, I was able to see that this was a once-off incident of utter horror. I'd successfully done presentations before, and I've successfully done presentations since. What it provided, though, was a valuable learning opportunity about my own strengths and weaknesses, and some insight into what I could do next time to avoid freezing up. Like, for instance, having emergency notes in my back pocket. Secondly, now, I'd like to turn to share a second story with you on my fear of writing. Now, I want to say up front that I absolutely love writing. My fear was and is specific to my thesis. This fear built up slowly over time. Supervision meetings were few and far between. I started to have a small niggling fear that I might be going slightly wrong direction in my project but I tried to ignore it. Unfortunately, over time, my fear grew and grew until it was so bad that when I sat down, I simply froze and my logical mind shut down. It was no longer a simple fear about getting some words down, but a complex compound fear. It fed into all my worries about passing the PhD or not, my potential reputation, future career options, income worries, housing issues, loneliness, a whole identity crisis or two, and more and more. It became this big mutant monster of ultimate fears combined. What I should have done at a far earlier stage was to go have a chat with my university counsellor. That said, it didn't matter that I started a conversation with her at a later stage. Uni counsellors are professionals who are trained to help and support you. I highly recommend them. I'm going to share a few words of wisdom that one of mine gave to me. First off, once we built some rapport, she asked me, what is fear? What is it that you fear? And what is the opposite of fear? I found that a tricky one. I thought the opposite might perhaps be love, and maybe so. The opposite I found most useful to think about, however, is courage. Courage itself is a tricky thing. I always think I'm not brave enough, tough enough, confident enough, but that isn't so. Courage requires that you do the action first, regardless of feeling, and then the feeling of courage itself comes later. I have a rainbow hippie flag kind of string in my office with values and sayings on them. One says, courage is not the absence of fear or despair, but the strength to conquer them. And I'll add to that, it's also the strength simply to sit with your fear in order to know it better. One of the most valuable things I've done while receiving proper support, I might add, is to explore and know the nature of my own fear. To learn to mindfully sit with it, to own it as mine, and to grow the opposites of it. Each person's circumstances are different. Your fears may be very, very different to mine. But do take some time to think by yourself 
about what it is that you might fear personally and grow the opposite. One of the best things ever is to actually value and grow your own circle of niceness. This concept is well explained in an article by Inga, which can be found through a link which we'll be sending out. By doing this, that is, going to speak with a close friend or university counsellor, by growing the opposites of fear and strengthening my own circle of niceness, bit by bit my fear melted away. Initially, I was too scared to write alone, so I began sitting in quiet areas of libraries with other people around me and writing there. Then I moved to writing with a close friend as a writing partner. Now I'm more than able to write alone, but I find that having a balance where I also write in the company of a friend helps keep my fears manageable and simple ones and not mega big monster ones. I hope that by sharing my own experiences may have helped you a bit, even if only to kind of think that we all have our fears together. If your fears are getting the better of you, however, do drop by your university counsellor for a chat or do follow up some other professional psychological support. I highly recommend it. Beyond Blue and the Black Dog Institute also have some excellent resources on proven mental health strategies that are very useful to know. A link to their web page will be circulated soon. So we turn now to some questions that were raised from the forums. The first on workload issues. My own experience resonated quite deeply with a very important forum post by GMW37. They say, and I'll read out, my fear is that my PhD will swallow me whole and that I will never get on top of it or be able to track with my workload. No matter what I do, I nearly always feel like I'm drowning with work that needs to be done, racing to meet deadlines and make the most of my PhD. How can I feel more in control of my project rather than it controlling me? Please help. That's a tough one but I freely admit that there was an extended period within my PhD where I felt like I was locked in a high-speed bullet train that had completely lost control. It felt like nothing I could do would slow it down or put on the brakes in order to get back on the tracks. What works for both Katie and I is learn to love project management techniques. These are Gantt charts, spreadsheets, etc. that can help you feel more organised and prioritise what needs to be done in what order. Some additional tips that I practice are, firstly, practice saying no and asking yourself, is this core business? Then, actually say no graciously when others are trying to shift non-essential tasks onto you. Secondly, block out some concrete you time so that you can properly rest and do something fun. It might be deciding no work on weekends. It might be putting aside a solid hour or so for lunch or deciding that there's going to be no work after 6 p.m. This will give your body and your mind a bit of downtime to rest and recover. It will help create a bit more balance between project time and personal time and might give you a feeling of greater control when you're on your clock for the PhD project. Third, create a priority list of tasks. That is, break down things into three main groups, basically super urgent and important, less urgent and important, and non-urgent and non-important. Triage tasks so that you can clear the deck of so-called emergency work and start focusing on that core business. Fourth, each day create a short targeted task list of, spe of specific things that you genuinely intend to do that day. Cross them off one by one when you complete them. It is such a great feeling when, you're, when you see your list shrinking and all those ticks in place. Most vitally, absolutely make sure that you have rewards built in for your accomplishments. Number five, sit down and have a real hard think about what it is that you are actually doing each day. Does it feed into core business? If not, why are you doing it? What does it feed into? Regardless of whether you're doing it or your choice or what it is, being aware of the reasons that you do particular tasks and your actions towards them is a first and very important step in, in learning to intentionally prioritise tasks and regain a sense of control. It would be great to hear what some other people think too about workloads and how to control the feeling that the thesis is getting away from you. Please share your ideas on the forum and on Twitter. We would love to hear them. 
So we turn now to a different topic. We have a question from Ma Cat about non-native speakers presenting in English. And I quote, It is even harder to speak in public when you are not a native speaker. If you have combined fear of public speaking and a language issue, how can you improve your talk? Dan Howden has an excellent video on YouTube that is well worth a look. I will summarise the key contents here, but do have a look of it later. Firstly, don't worry about your accent. We all have them. It's part of who we are and adds to your unique character. What matters most is the content of what you say and being understood. All the rest is extra. Think about the natural speed or rhythm of your primary tongue. You might need to speak a little bit slower if you come from a language where you habitually speak fast, such as Spanish. It may be even too fast for native English speakers. Inga has found some great YouTube videos with tips on doing presentations that are well worth a look. If you do want to sound more like a native English speaker, then there is also a great video from Learn English specifically on pronunciation. Even Inga found this video enlightening. We didn't realise how crazy most of spoken English sounds. If you get nervous before a talk, and I know that I certainly do, Impromptu <coughs> Guru has a video with 52 great tips. Some of these are a bit weird, but extremely useful, and there are some techniques that everyone can do to present well. Science Korea also has a great article full of advice for early career scientists presenting in English for the first time. What's interesting is that these tips can apply to everyone, regardless of whether you're in science or the humanities. There's a second article from Presentation Prep has some interesting tips for non-native speakers, but I found the section on use more verbs the best. This leads me to a very important point. Spoken English is very different from written English. Reading out your paper sh should be the presentation strategy of last resort. And unfortunately, I'm doing just that tonight, <laughs> as it's the first time I've used Periscope, and I was scared I would freeze up. <laughs> um, but you're doing a great job! Thank you, Katie! <laughs> Yay! Um, but written English is truly a different type of dialect than spoken English. Huge respect to anyone attempting a thesis in English who hasn't spoken it at all um, in a formal academic context. But remember, there is a lot of advantages to this as well. You have, for instance, learnt to speak grammar properly, whereas a lot of us Australian people haven't. So that is a very good and real <laughs> asset. <laughs> it's not bad, it's just different. It is different, that's right. <laughs> Katie has Canadian English, which is a lot more grammatically correct, I find. I don't think that's true, it's just politer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not bogan English. Oh, oh, no classism here. Okay, we shall move on now <laughs> to a topic of the supervisor not helping at all during a presentation. So we have a great question and issue raised by Berio. They say, at my introductory seminar, I had a comment from one of my supervisors about I'm not asking what you would like to do in your research. And he seemed so angry, and everyone in the room stayed quiet, just looking. I just smiled and answered him, something to deal with it. But there was this repressed emotion of telling him, are you helping me at all? Now, I'm sorry to hear that you had to go through that, Bere. That's really rough. I think you did really well in what is a genuinely tricky situation. I've seen something similar to this happen to people before and I really do not like it. What I don't like is the silence that seems to pervade when there is an aggressive and hostile line of questioning raised. It is the duty of the seminar chair, if you have one, to step in if this is the case, but rarely have I seen a chair with the guts who actually follows through with this. Mm. One solution forward might be to talk to a staff member or supervision panel member you trust about how you felt during that presentation and how you feel now about your supervisor. Share with them that you feel uneasy about how to go forward. They may be able to help you hold a joint meeting with everyone present where everyone can voice their concerns and help clear the waters. It might have been that your supervisor had a very, very stressful week and was kind of acting out, but really that is no excuse. Everyone in that room, though, saw you acting professionally. That is, they saw you smiling and answering calmly 
to a supervisor who is behaving badly, essentially. And that is awesome. We turn now to handling difficult questions at presentations, which is essentially linked to the question before. So also on the topic of presentations, Hannah Carver posted, I get really anxious at the end of presentations in case I'm asked a question that I don't know the answer to, or if I give the wrong answer and look like an idiot. How can I improve my confidence at answering these questions? Now that is a great issue to raise, and it sparked some awesome responses. Gulzum suggested that practicing beforehand is a great idea with a friend. Inga suggested turning back the question on the question of themselves to expand upon. Both great tips. Inga has also shared with us a link to a cool YouTube video on the four magic phrases that can answer anything. It's a bit of a nutty video, but it's genius really. These phrases buy you time to think and diffuse potentially hostile academic audiences when you come under fire at question time. Basically, you start with, that's interesting, and then add one of four possible answers. So, tell me more, or why would you say that, or why would you do that, or why would you ask that? And that buys you time enough to hopefully get an answer for me in your brain, which you can then share with the audience. I agree with CUNY and Alex Nine, who suggested that actually practicing saying you don't know the answer can be a really good solution. It's taken me a while, but I, when I genuinely don't know the answer, I admit it. And then, just like Alison3926 suggested, I thank the questioner for making an excellent point. I'll then say, I'll note it down and investigate later and definitely follow up. And do remember to actually note it down. Another method, if you feel brave, is to then open the question up to the audience and to the floor as an open discussion and a dialogue for everyone to take part. Sometimes you could get some really good suggestions and tips this way. Alex Nine adds that saying that you don't know the answer doesn't actually look bad, and quite the contrary. Mm. Alex says, actually the professors I'm most impressed by are those that had to admit they didn't know or got something wrong. I think this shows a lot of courage and integrity that they put scientific honesty first before their ego. And I'd have to agree with that. Alison3926 rightly pointed out that sometimes the questioner is simply trying to make themselves look good. She also shares that, my supervisor once told me that it is a great gift to ask a question of someone because it gives them the opportunity to expand upon what they were saying and explain it in more detail. I think that's well worth us all remembering. Next, we have dealing with extra long questions. Also in questions during presentations, Antonio Fellow asks, how should we deal with extra long questions? This is part of the fear of being rude. What to do with a question from someone in the audience that seems to have become glued to the microphone and starts talking for so long that you don't even know what that question was anymore? <laughs> and I think we've all seen some of that. Steph Bertazzoni says, whoever it is who isn't able to ask a question in less than 60 seconds is probably not even interested in the answer as much as the sound of their own voice. <laughs> Possibly quite so. Kimberly AM suggests that briefly summing up what the person has said and then, firstly, either reflecting back their question to them and checking that you have it correct, or secondly, answering it as best you can and then asking them, does that answer your question? Or thirdly, asking them politely to briefly repeat your question. Katie herself uses a strategy where she writes down the question that the while the person says it. That way it's easier to come back to their main point. She tells them directly, I'm just writing down your question so I can answer it clearly. I think that's an excellent strategy. Inga shares that sometimes she's had to say, I'm sorry, but that was way too long to follow and I don't know where you're going. Can you give me a shorter version? I've actually seen different people use this live, and it does work. Um, it can help the questioner stay on track, but that is the job of the seminar chair, really, to rein people in if they're going way off track. Thankfully, I've seen a chair step in from time to time during questionings for this, but it doesn't always happen. So flipping the tables and asking about questioning instead, we have an anonymous student who asks, I like to contribute to our discipline's weekly research meetings, 
for asking a question of the presenter after their talk. Maybe my questions lack clarity or are too off topic because the facilitator always seems to cut me off and redirect the conversation. The discussion always ends up with me being between the few staff members while the students there sit mute and not part of the discussion. Should I keep my mouth shut unless I'm sure that I have something clever to say, which may not happen, or persist in attempts to join the discussion with the fear that my questions will never be clever enough? Asking good questions is actually an art. There are some good resources on the internet which can help you think through these skills. Firstly, there are some really good tips here on open versus closed questions, and we'll be sending out the links to these. Secondly, there is an article from the Wall Street Journal which talks about children's tactics of asking questions, which is a really good point to return to. Our team member, Crystal, has also suggested joining Toastmasters as an excellent way of both practicing giving presentations and also rhetorical questioning techniques. We turn to another issue now, which is cultural communication errors. And I think we've all seen these as well. Amita Kay raised an excellent question about cross-cultural communication, posting. What I've seen in the videos here online is the conflict caused by completely different sets of expectations based on cultural differences between the supervisor and the candidate. I experienced similar things when I was at the university studying for a master's degree. In hindsight, I believe that teachers, lecturers or supervisors require training in cultural understanding of the student's background for effective communication and engagement. Generally, there seems to be reluctant, reluctance sorry, to invest in such training, which leads to a lot of frustration both for the students as well as the supervisors. Can this be taken on board by universities to improve their effectiveness towards international students? Michael Campbell, Grace Five, and myself all agree that this is an issue that really needs to be tackled. Inga herself also shares that intercultural communication is a topic of lively debate and interest in academic circles. In fact, she is on the supervision panel of a student who is studying this very topic. She agrees that although very little training is available, in the whole of 10 years of study as a research education person, she's only had the chance to go to two workshops on this and both times she was amazed at what she found. Inga says that I guess universities prioritise their staff training budgets in different ways and it's often, what, it's often with a focus on the teaching technique. I'm not sure what can be done about this but I did seek out these particular videos which we've shown through the MOOC as they're a rare example of good training material on this very topic. We now have a post about dealing with anxiety. Finally, Inga and the team thought this was a very, very thoughtful comment from Geoffrey Goff. And I'll read out his post now. It's a long one, but a very good one. Geoffrey says, As a lifelong anxiety sufferer, avoidant behaviour runs deep. Even to comment on here takes a fair measure of control and determination. People I would not believe, people would not believe, sorry, that I have anxiety. They especially would not believe that I have a high degree of performance anxiety. I have worked on this by choice over 15 years. I have played bass guitar in two bands, completed a presenting course at a local TV station, and since completing my degree have begun facilitating thoughts and resilience workshops for carers of ASD kids. Each exposure to these situations helps reduce anxiety of that situation. However, it is usually only for that situation. A new or different situation brings with it a new or different anxiety. I struggle with social media like Facebook due to its post to be like connotations. To me, with this, I created our anonymous Tumblr blog and deliberately post the things that make me most anxious about being, without being concerned about it needing to be liked or that anyone I know will see it. It has helped me a lot. I also galvanised myself enough to, for the fourth year running, once again organise the Brisbane run of the Distinguished Gentleman's Ride, in which I assembled and led 340 motorcyclists through the city to raise money for prostate cancer research, and he'll post a pic if he can. I was also overwhelmed with anxiety over the ride last year that I did not intend to organise another, 
but I did, and it went exceptionally well. The best yet, in fact. What I have learned about anxiety and fear over the years is that you don't just beat it once and you're done. You beat it every time and every time is new, but you can beat it. Awesome and very powerful words. So thank you, Jeffrey, for your wisdom. So we come now, if we have some time, yeah. for questions. Okay. <laughs> um, we absolutely can. That's right. Um, could Barbara, you, like, can you keep an eye for Periscope questions while I read some of the Twitter ones? Thank you, everyone. Um, Catherine pointed out that extra long questions are incredibly common in Italy, and it's really oh, hard okay. to avoid not answering it or not listening to it because mm. of the cultural difference there. So there's a bit of questions about how questions are asked and answered varies interculturally, as yep. makes obvious sense. Prince Lisan pointed out, anxiety is why gin was invented. That and is I a just very good point. I agree with that very passionately. So thank you for some help for gin. Which... <laughs> well, that's it. GNT therapy is a tried and true method, but like any therapy, it should be taken in moderation and in balance. <laughs> But it's one I also drive. partake in. That's it. Don't drive yeah. after therapy. Get a friend to drive you home <laughs> therapy session. That's yes, right. Kim says, and wine. Don't forget wine. We never forget wine. No, wine must, <laughs> must also be mentioned. Okay. <laughs> um, Kim recommended a project management tool called Asana, A-S-A-N-A. -A -A, okay, she uses Asana. Yes. Yeah, so cool. that's a recommendation for everyone. And... Um, some people shared their fears, which are all various and wonderful. Oh, well, you guys, thank you. That's very brave. It is actually very brave to speak your fears publicly. It can be very therapeutic for you, but it does require a lot of courage. So I think all of us here are like, well done. Yes. Um, and uh, Tegan just suggested, for extra long questions uh, at conferences, I say, can you say that in less than 140 characters? So. That's interesting. <laughs> so a solution to the long question, get them to tweet it, but verbally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Verbal tweet, hashtag survive PhD. That's today. right. That's right. All right. Does anyone have any other questions? Have you got any questions on Periscope? No, no mainly just comments. Yeah. Okay, um, that's all right. There's some extra um, management tools suggested. Um, Fantastic. One called MindSpot. Okay, we've got MindSpot mentioned. That's that's awesome. Priscillian. Yep. Um, but mainly mm. it's it's comment and lots of congratulations, Steph. You're doing really well. <laughs> yeah, so oh, thank, thank you guys. That, thank you. And much <laughs> love back. You guys rock. Genuinely. <laughs> well, Panda says, I thought you said gym. Exercise ah. is important for anxiety management. Gym is also very important. I will say that. Exercise can be crucial in managing your stress and fear levels, actually, because what happens with fear, and you'll notice in the, the reading for the module, your amygdala in your brain can get triggered, and that releases all sorts of chemicals throughout your body. What gentle exercise does, and you'll need to do at least 30 minutes of continuous exercise, even if it's walking, is that it releases endorphins back into your system. And that counteracts and flushes out a lot of those kind of stress chemicals. I'm kind of majorly abridging what happens. So if you want to read this in more in depth, I'm sure we can find a link to post, which we'll do a bit later. But making sure that you move your body and come back to your body, especially with doing work on the mind so much, is a very important thing. Totally. Yeah. Could not agree more. Awesome. Um, I think... That's about it. Fantastic. Everyone's saying, well done on Twitter. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Yay. Let's hear it Yay. <laughs> thank you, guys. I've got a closing statement in my notes, which you're going to read. Please do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was going to say, and I genuinely think this, a massive thank you to everyone tonight who's managed to join us online. It is, it is really wonderful for you all to be here and sending comments and questions in. It does feel like a genuine community, and that's only because you guys make it so. So thank you very, very much. Um, the links to all the resources that we've mentioned will be sent through Twitter, but you'll also be able to find them later online through the Storify. I'll make sure that they're there. Um, so wherever you are joining us tonight, students and supervisors alike, good morning, good day, and good night, and I look forward to seeing you on the forums and on Twitter and at next, next week's live chat. Same time, same place. Thank you, everyone. Good night.